That's great. And now we're going to bring in, um, and they're already in here, but we've got um, Alex Reed and Dallas Donnell, who are part of the asynchronous presentation panel, uh, the asynchronous stream uh, that's, that's up next, Cruising Utopias. Unfortunately, uh, the other two presentations never made it into us on video. So we're going to have a, a, a more sprawled out chat um, with Alex and uh, Dallas uh, in this session. So uh, Alex, do you want to unmute yourself? And Dallas, you want to unmute yourself? Happily, can you, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? This is Dallas. Yes, I can hear both of you. So, um, yeah, so the session that we are about to begin is called, as I mentioned, Cruising Youthtopias. And this is our first live discussion of an asynchronous stream. Um, hopefully all of you got to see the amazing videos, truly, that Alex and Dallas put together. Um, Alex's presentation was called Order, Joy, and Youth, Parade Aesthetics and Popular Music. And Dallas's presentation was Mask Off, Future Trap Music and Aesthetic Nihilism in Black Pop. And so what I'm going to do is ask each of them to just give a little brief, um, you know, capsule summary of what their presentations are about, just to remind us. And uh, yeah, and then we'll open the floor up for discussion of these two videos, these two talks. Great. Um, Dallas, do you want to go first? Do you, do you want me to? You go first. Go for it. All right. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my name is Alex Reed. I'm a uh, professor of music at Ithaca College. And... Um, with the topic of youth and childhood at the center of this year's PopCon, um, I got thinking about what are some of the ways that um, that the very young, that, that people, let's say, uh, under the age of 10, engage with music. And so I got thinking about parades. Um, and uh, long story short, I got thinking about the, the parade as a medium and uh, via McLuhan, sort of what the, what the message of of the medium of a parade is and how that relates to popular music and um, where I sort of ended up with is the idea that the parade instrumentalizes its participants for the sake of instrumentalization right when you when you join in a parade um, you're stepping into the promise of being something uh, of being part of something bigger than yourself and so you're getting to extend your arms you're getting to extend your legs you have people literally walking on stilts you have people holding up giant balloons um, and uh, and there's musical uh, signifiers that go along with this as well. Um, order, shouting out, uh, organized harmonies, things like this. And basically the idea of making yourself bigger for the sake of making yourself bigger as a medium message of a parade rather than the actual content of a parade, whatever the parade is about, um, I found uh, I found to be really, really compelling in as much as it relates to, um, you know, aspirational desires of growing up when you're a kid, right? You want to be big. And then the other thing that um, people say about parades, as I, as I read through some of the histories of... Oh, coronation parades and if you look at something like the Wizard of Oz where Dorothy is walking around and she meets you know the um, uh, the lollipop gang and she meets the coroner and she meets the mayor of Munchkin Pound and stuff like that is that we miniaturize the world in a parade where you might have some sort of civic parade uh, in which there's a small representation of any number of groups uh, that are all um, standing in as sort of uh, metaphor or as a uh, synecdoche of the city right as um, uh, a small, small version of, of the entire world. So think also here of like, it's a small world after all uh, at Disney World. And so when you have the body getting bigger and the world getting smaller, then there's this real sense of access, right? Um, you as a kid who are usually denied access, and I remember feeling this way a lot when I was very, very young. Um, as a kid, if you're denied access to the world, the parade kind of gives you the idea that you can um, get access to the world because it's getting smaller and you're getting bigger. And this also explains why there's kind of a double gaze going on when you're in the parade, you're imagining what you look like to the people who are watching. And when you're watching, you imagine being in the parade, right? You, you, you want to participate and the, um, the borders between the inside and the outside get really, really blurry when we're talking about parades. And that's, you know, um, uh, a thing that we can very, very easily move over into musical practice when we start talking about like call and response things. And when we start talking about, um, uh, when we st start talking about, you know, audience sing-alongs and things like that. So, um, where I ended up my presentation uh, was sort of a think piece on um, uh, very early hip hop music. And this is a topic that I spent a long time uh, looking at and uh, sorry, my cat's batting at my leg. Um, very early hip hop music. And I was looking at the funky four plus one, uh, also called the funky four plus one more. 
and um, in a song like That's the Joint, how they have these kind of trade-offs um, on the mic. And if you go see, you know, your sort of classic pre-1985 hip-hop show, you might have matching suits or you might have um, costumes. I'm thinking here of Africa Bombada. Uh, but uh, you'll also get this kind of classic passing the mic thing of I say this and you say that and he said, she said, we say that. And uh, just this idea of coordination that to a five-year-old just makes their eyes widen and say, holy cow, I want to be part of that. And it doesn't matter what they're necessarily singing about. Of course, it matters a little bit. But, um, but, to, the, but to the very young child, um, there's an invitation that you could be part of this big thing and all you have to do is to kind of step into it. So I was really interested in that kind of mechanic and, um, and where it might lead us in thinking about how the young engage with music. And uh, you can also see this with you know, things like the Musketeers or things like you know, Another Bad Creation, or I'm thinking also here of My Chemical Romance's Black Parade, you know, the idea of you know, come on and join and you get you know, whole legions of uh, kids under 18 um, all, all joining in. So that was the main sort of territory that I covered in my presentation. And uh, this um, just the surface that I scratched with it, but I think that, that, um, that there are some examples that we could come up with that would take us further. Great. Dallas, do you want to give us a little sense of uh, what your presentation was all about? Sure, sure. So my name is Dallas Donnell. Um, I'm a PhD student in the American Studies program at the University of Maryland. And my, um, my presentation, um, Future Trap Music and Aesthetic Nihilism, I have this idea called Aesthetic Nihilism. And it's a theoretical framework to engage with black popular music that is decidedly nihilistic and you know there's different definitions of nihilism we could do like the Nietzschean or you know Heidegger kind of nihilism I'm still working through it I think of nihilism more so in like the music um journalist kind of way like the sex pistols or something like that or um odd future like how we think of that music as being decidedly nihilistic so I'm thinking about a kind of certainty about hopelessness um, you know, a, a self-indulgence over longevity, a sense of meaninglessness in, toward life, etc. Um, and so I chose to um, engage Future's music in regards to this. Um, and so aesthetic nihilism is a, an artistic approach um, that allows Black artists to disidentify with nihilism by operating within a nihilistic worldview and kind of performing um, the the sense of hopelessness and withdrawal that would that naturally kind of comes from living under an anti-black white supremacist white supremacist social structure um so um it's not an endorsement of apathy or hopelessness or withdrawal but when we apply that this framework to it it can reflect the persistence of anti-blackness the ineffectiveness of civil rights era strategies, um, notions of progress, hope and change that are kind of paramount or kind of at the forefront historically or have been at the forefront historically of black politics and black, um, um, black activism. And it can urge for or call for or suggest for more radical tactics towards upending um, the social structure. Um, and yeah, there's other examples. Future I thought was an interesting case because he's more current and fairly controversial. Trap music is kind of a right now controversial sort of thing, I think. I think a lot of people think of it as something that's um, negative or destructive towards Black youth. Um, but what I want aesthetic nihilism to do is to help us to engage with cultural objects um, that young Black people are involved in or enjoy, and instead of castigating them or I think criminalizing and maybe doing violence to their kind of creative expression, but to find a way to analyze it and think about it in a way that's productive. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. There's other examples. I've looked at Sly and the Family Stones. There's a riot going on as another example of this. Um, some of Frank Ocean's work, a few others, but I thought Future would be just an interesting case study for this idea. So that's it. Great, thank you both. And you know, um, what, one of the things that these kind of asynchronous presentation discussions are supposed to do is, is give, a give us a chance to have a conversation between the presenters, as well as obviously those of you who've had the chance to watch the presentation or have questions based on the kind of brief capsule descriptions that um, our presenters have given. And, you know, I'm going to go ahead and start with, you know, just a, a, an observation and then kind of invite our presenters to say something, but also please feel free to enter your questions to the 
chat box or, or raise your hand um, electronically or what have you. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm actually kind of struck by, you know, you're both on the kind of cruising utopias rubric. Uh, uh, we're both joined together in this rubric and we have at one point the kind of parade aesthetics that gestures towards uh, a kind of utopianism and that's kind that's that's used as you're saying Alex in your in your presentation to kind of almost recruit a kind of people to hip hop through a certain kind of joyfulness and and uh, Dallas in your presentation uh, what you really engage I guess is a kind of pop music aesthetic version of uh, what theoretically has been called a certain afro pessimism right right and so and so I'm wondering you know how you two might see those two things Can you all hear me or is this, did I freeze or did you freeze? Um, I didn't freeze, but I wasn't able to hear the rest of what Karen was saying. Okay. So I don't know, did she freeze for you or? She did freeze for me. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think Karen froze for everybody. All right, that's fine. Okay. I, think, I think that we can kind of see where she was going. Um, mm -hmm. At least I, I would love to, to, to talk about how, how our, our topics relate. First of all, uh, what a great topic. It reminds me of, if we're thinking about early examples of some of the um, some of the really darker Gil Scott hair and stuff, and uh, mm -hmm. um, and uh, have you have you seen? Uh, so here, let me just ask this instead. The discourse around resilience, right? Um, the idea that um, no matter how bad things get, that you can and should always, you know, stand up. And I'm thinking here about like the the Spider Verse movie that came out a year or so ago, uh, two years ago, or or for that matter, the fact that Katy Perry's new album is literally all about resilience. She has a song called Resilience on it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know that Robin James talks about resilience being um, one of these sort of neoliberal mandates. And if we're thinking about some kind of social progress, it's a mandate that says, you know, uh, don't give up. You can always you can always keep going. You can always over, you know, we, we will overcome. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the nihilism that you're talking about in futures music and in, you know, um, uh, some of the other artists that you're mentioning um, to me seems like not merely a denial of that, but a kind of symbolic blow against all the neoliberalist stuff that that stands for? Right. Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. And because it's, you know, when it's when we're talking about, you know, standing up that kind of imperative, like stand up, keep pushing, keep pushing. I mean, what does that really do? If it doesn't work, which I could argue, it doesn't work or it hasn't worked the way we tried to be to do that over the years historically in terms of mobilization and poly, uh, you know activist tactics etc then what are we really doing we're kind of doing this sort of hamster wheel you know what i'm saying there's this hamster wheel logic around black politics and social movements if we don't reach beyond the voting the marching the speeching the speeches and things like that so it's almost like in a way it valorizes that suffering it valorizes that pain as being somehow um, an inevitable part of the process and a part of the project, but with no real end in sight, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, if people have other comments or questions on that, I would love to hear from folks. I think as far as um, Karen's question about the dystopia that you're talking about, the fact that, you know, there's the illusion of this wheel that you're, or rather that there's, there's the illusion of progress, but it's really more like a wheel. Um, and, you know, how, how many of us have heard some or have said some version of, golly, have we really come any ways in the last X number of years, right? You know, yeah. since, since, you know, since 2016, since 1950, since 18, you know, whatever. Um, but the dystopia that you're talking about and the kind of utopia that I'm talking about, I think that the fact that they stand at respective ends of childhood are really important to, to that mm -hmm. difference because um, um, some of the moral panic surrounding nihilism in hip hop that I have read, um, and I'm, um, I'm remembering when, you know, uh, when like, the weekend was first coming out and you know i can't feel my face and people perfect example yeah yeah um, perfect example uh, right um some of that the tone of it was saying not just this is so nihilistic but how are these people so nihilistic at suck uh, at such a young age 
right? Right. Because yeah. Because because when you'd listen to Gil Scott Heron, um, you know he was talking about uh, grown up problems, right? Whereas mm-hmm. there are a lot of people, uh, I'm thinking of like Chief Keef as well as well. Uh, who, Perfect example as well. Right. right. Um, who who might be making like really nihilistic, um, really you know dystopian, apocalyptic stuff, who are you know. 16 17 18 years old and so it's not just this is this is troubling but like how did these people get so jaded at such a young age i mean exactly and so i'm just looking for something some way some language that we can use to address that you know to address the way in which those artists are dismissed i mean i was living in i was living in chicago i was working for the black youth project in 2011 or 12 and that was when the drill scene in Chicago was blowing up. I mean, it was huge. And, you know, Chief Keith and Katie got bands and all these young artists. And it was like, I remember Rhyme Fest. He did like an op ed and was like, you know, Chief Keith is scary. This is so dangerous. This is so negative and destructive. And it's like, you know, drill, that music was totally grassroots. That was like passing tapes around in Chicago public high schools. That's how drill music blew up. You know, it wasn't a a top-down approach as I remember it. I mean, it was really kids passing tapes around like old school type, you know, stuff that would happen in like the 80s with mixtapes and things like that. So how can you dismiss that? You know, you have to kind of give it a certain attention and slow down the critique here and really think about how to pull out an understanding of it that actually brings clarity of some sort to the experiences that young people are having. And it's interesting with with utopia, you know, dystopia and the concept around parade aesthetics and it wanting people, you know, people joining in and it welcoming you into something. It's funny because I think where a lot of where our work kind of aligns too is that if you look at like Chief Keef again, or Odd Future, there's a way in which kids had the same response. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, there was yeah. a camaraderie and a like, oh my gosh, you feel the same way as I do. You see that across the history of, of popular music, period. You know? Yep. One of the things that occurs to me also, when you're talking about um, like the drill scene being a really grassroots thing, the most optimistic parades are never the ones planned by young people, right? Parades mm-hmm. are usually, you know, organized by someone up top. There's always some, some person who says, "Okay, this is, this is, uh, this is our budget. These are going to be our sponsors. These are going to be you know, right. costumes and things like that." And when I think about, like, pop music aimed at very young people, I'm talking here about like the Wiggles, right? Or, mm-hmm. or, or, or let's say that we're talking about Crisscross, right? In all these cases, you always got some grown up behind the scene saying. All right, here's how we're going to do this. Yeah, right? and the Svengali, like, right. Yeah, exactly, exactly, right? And so there's a sense of, okay, I know what the kids want. And it's not that they say, it's not that they know the content that's, that, that the kids want. It's that they know the form that the kids will be attracted to or something like that. And so, right. um, and so they put together this, you know, uh, boy band or girl group or whatever it is, right? Um, and then, gosh, I'm thinking right now about uh, um, Jojo Siwa and, and how she is just now coming out of like her her phase of having been controlled by adults and now she's like kind of turning into herself which is uh-huh. i mean she was she was always herself but i mean now she's sort of figuring out what it's like to be um a person with agency and 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 your own um you know control over yourself and stuff like that and yeah i think that when you have the kids and i put that in quote in quotes creating their own parade it ends up being much more anarchic right and ends right. up being much much crazier and much more unhinged than when you have a nice adult sponsored parade um and that might be also i mean to go back to to, to hip-hop where we kind of overlap although at different ends of the chronology that might also be part of the development between really early hip-hop i mean i'm thinking here about um you know the the famous story about the sugar hill gang you know which is again one of these sort of svengali moments where sylvia robinson is like okay i'm going to get some people together and we're going to go and do right. this studio um yeah. versus when we started getting the actual uh the grassroots recordings and of course hip-hop had existed as a grassroots movement before that but i'm thinking about you know the rise of of like um you know mid mid 80s very early gangster rap and things like mm-hmm. that yeah great yeah absolutely hey everyone sorry i dropped out again as those of you who've been here with the, from the beginning know our internet is down um, oh, in no. a large area of Los Angeles because of oh. um, the wildfires and what have you. So, um, oh, you know, it came back and then I was on my computer and now I'm back on my phone. So 
Um, that means that if you have any comments or questions, um, please raise your hand or unmute yourself or, or indicate that you want to ask a question and make a comment because I'm I have to scroll through like a gazillion screens or type your question in the chat. Um, now that I'm using a phone instead of a laptop. Um, yeah, just just go ahead and poke in with any comments or questions or remarks you might have. Uh, Dallas, can I ask you something? Sure. Yeah, um, in the in the chat, hold on, let me see who's this. Uh, Rebecca Rinsema said uh, Ferris Bueller when I was talking about parade things. And if you see <laughs> Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right, Chicago, of course, uh, there's the scene where he not only joins in the parade, but then starts leading the parade, right? And this is this whole yeah, fantasy moment in the film. And um, this is a movie about a high schooler, but oftentimes when we see portrayals, either through sound or through film or whatever, of let's say someone who's uh, in high school, then the audience is aspirational to that, right? The audience might be in middle school, or if we see, you know, something about someone who's in their early 20s, then the audience might be people who are in their teens or something like that, because they mm -hmm. can relate to this, but this person is one step ahead of them, which allows them to imagine themselves growing into this in the near future. Right. Um, in what ways do you or don't you see that happening in the music that you study? Like, if you're seeing artists who are uh, who are let's say in their 20s or in their late teens or something like that making um, you know quote-unquote nihilist music do they seem to be addressing people exactly their age a little bit under or are they speaking up in some way I don't know um, like and you don't mean explicitly you mean like just there's like kind of a, um, a feedback loop happening between the artist and, and a, a kind of an admiring younger audience yeah i mean if if it's explicit then let us know but but yeah usually these things are not i think i think so i think so i mean i remember i remember when i was in high school and um i graduated in 2006 so this is like yeah so lil wayne at the time hadn't put out the carter three yet you know, it wasn't, he was still, it was like Carter II, you know, he's kind of building, he's about to start to really revolutionize the mixtape game and do all of that. And in my high school, there was one guy with dreads. It was one kid. It was like hundreds of us, one kid with dreads. That was it. And he was Rastafarian. I loved him. His name was Tariq. One kid. After Lil Wayne, that generation after him, I mean, not uh, dreads, dive dreads, like skater shoes. And I mean, just so there, it, there's a clear, you know, way in which there's like a maybe a four or five year gap between like what Wayne was doing and how it really caught on with that younger, that younger crowd. I think that's happening now. You know, I'm, I'm not of their generation per se, you know, but you can see how future so greatly influenced someone like Lil Uzi Vert. Like there's just a very clear, but he's kind of taking it into another, maybe more complex or um, abstract direction, I think. And I'm certain, you know, when you look at what's starting to be on Rap Caviar and what's starting to be on SoundCloud, you know, there is kind of a, um, a way in which these certain artists are certainly leading the parade, if you will. You know, yeah. I just want, instead of the narrative being leading the parade into destruction, <laughs> I hope that we can maybe think about it differently, you know, just have like a different approach towards the music. It's not going to be perfect, you know, but I definitely see what you mean, that there's definitely that kind of generational pull. Um, the nihilist sort of turn in, in hip hop music, I mean, I, you can go back to like the beginnings of horrorcore if you want to find you know real yeah. examples of it. But you mentioned that it kind of becomes a thing around like 2011, 2012, or whatever. Um, is it still as strong now as it was eight or nine years ago? Has it grown, or was that kind of a moment that that is now behind us? Like how how do you keep being a nihilist artist for nine years at a time? I don't I don't think it I in my opinion I don't think it's growing. I wouldn't say that. When you look at some of the biggest artists of the past, like Juice World, I wouldn't call his work, I don't know, maybe, you know what I mean? But I don't think there was like, a, there was like, during that time, like Waka Flock of Flame, like Flock of Veli, that was like a metal, a heavy, like a death metal um, 
are the artwork was like death metal, like blood, you know, his head guns to his head. I mean, it wasn't even just the sound, it was the aesthetic. Odd Future with all the skulls and the X's on the face. You know, they were like really doing a very complete project there, you know, that was incredibly dark. You know, Future's music and his music videos back then were really, I mean, the lean and the way he would just you know, look at the sky and, you know, it was like, clearly there was a hopelessness there. I don't know if that's as, um, as prevalent now, you know, I, I, make, I mean, I guess there's some, but I wouldn't say that it's like the sound right now, in my opinion. But it's kind of, I guess the point is that, you know, the aesthetic nihilism idea isn't just specific to trap. You know what I mean? That it kind of peaks and there's peaks and valleys, I think, across Black music where something particularly nihilistic or that kind of posture takes hold and becomes really, really popular. I would argue that it's at certain epochs. Like, I think I would argue that the post-Obama era, and by that I mean after Obama was elected through to now, I think it's it's paradoxical to some that at the height of, you know, allegedly Black political access and participation, you have this dark nihilistic version of hip hop emerge and really take hold. So I think like you could also look at Sly Stone and say post late sixties, the death of Dr. King, you know, Altamont, like Charles Manson murders, you have this funk sound that's really dark and murky and kind of a sense of hopelessness that it's sort of um, has, there's a historical context, I think, for the way it kind of emerges and then sort of drifts off. And I would say drifts off into just pure self-indulgence, probably. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Where it's just, we're all fat and making money now. If I can kind of dovetail off of that, and I'm also seeing a question here in the chat that said, uh, have you found any challenges while analyzing ostensibly nihilist aesthetics in music? And do you differentiate nihilist aesthetics versus aesthetic nihilism, as you theorize? Um, I'm gonna, what you were saying about the sort of dark music um, under Obama being paradoxical to some, I'm gonna I'm gonna step into my other sort of role that I do in music. I talk a lot about gothic and industrial music. That's like my my stomping oh, cool. grounds. Uh, yeah, so like I've, uh, I'll 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 give some TMI here. Um, I'm depressed. I'm on uh, I'm on antidepressants, right? And there's this whole discourse in antidepressants about like. Oh, be careful about this one because some people actually harm themselves after they start taking it. And some doctors were like, oh no, is it some different brain unexpected thing? And to me, the answer is obvious. The answer is that if you start taking an antidepressant, and let's say that you're feeling like a one out of 10 in a baseline to start with, and it bumps you up to a four out of 10, and you say, oh geez, is this really as good as it gets? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then, then yeah, sure, this is better, but this is still trash, right? So I could, I could uh, certainly, you know, understand how in a lot of historical moments, even if there appear to be some advances, you know, we look around and it's 2020 and there's, you know, still, still police brutality, right? There's still all these problems. And if having, you know, um, uh, Obama in, in the White House doesn't, doesn't magically fix everything in a way that a lot of, I think, uh, white liberals wished it would, uh, then, you know, then, then where does that leave you, you know? Right, right, exactly. You know, there's just, there's particular moments that bring into stark relief, you know, what I think is like a, um, a harsh and sort of disappointing truth perhaps about progress, about the notion of progress and change in America and in the West regarding racial, you know, racial politics, that there's just a persistence of this. And it, I, I agree that it's in those moments where there should be something really powerful and something really great. And there should be some kind of like, um, uh, um, like end result, like a, like a yeah, solution, yeah. like a new beginning. And you see that really it's just going to inevitably become more of the same, you know, maybe with something that on its surface feels like radical, real change, like a black president, my God, you know, and it's not that that doesn't bring joy, you know, and there's space for joy. And that's why I love your project, because I reading it and looking at it, I felt joyful. <laughs> I really did. Like, yeah, no, it yeah. took me back to being a kid and discovering music and that being a part of the music that I loved was there was definitely like a come on, come with us, come be a part of something, you know? So there's room for joy and, and you know, 
President Obama brought people joy. You know, my grandfather has a picture on his wall of he still can't believe that it was, you know, so it's not, that's a, been a challenge for me is not being like an asshole really about this stuff. And you know what I mean? I don't want to be a party pooper, you know, but you just yeah. see these things and you want not to, to erase or invalidate joyful music or, you know, communal like joy about something that's happened. That's wonderful. But also to attend to this other stuff that maybe makes us uncomfortable, you know? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, on that sorry. note, on being a party pooper, um, we are officially <laughs> out of time um, for this session. But because of our handy two Zoom system, I can accommodate a couple more minutes for any last questions um, out of this wonderful conversation between our two um, presenters from this asynchronous stream. So um, speak now, or uh, we'll shut down around 10.35. So we have about, I'll give us an extra five minutes. And if anybody, um, those of you who um, are interested in the other session, it begins at a the other block of sessions, those begin at 11 a.m. in Zoom 2, a.k.a. Conference Room 2, a.k.a. Stage 2 at the festival. So, um, yeah, any questions to share? Or any final comments? I cut Alex off because... <clears throat> no, it's fine. Um, I was going to go into the question of aesthetic nihilism versus nihilist aesthetics, but uh, <laughs> we're all good. This was, this was great. Thank yeah. You. But does anybody, yeah, but does anybody in the audience, I know, because this has been a really great conversation. I really appreciated um, that, you know, uh, the, 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 the extent to which your presentations spoke to each other. Okay. Well, if there aren't any further questions, um, I guess I'll ask the presenters, do you have any last comments that you want to make? in the extra four minutes of time that we now have been gifted. Not really, just thank you for this. I loved that. This was a really great conversation. I really enjoyed this, Alex. I thought this was great. I hope we can keep in touch. And yes. I just appreciated this opportunity. This was cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. So and much. if you, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Alex. Oh, I was just gonna say thank you to you and uh, to everyone at Mopop. I know that this has been, um, a challenge to to organize so so thank you for helping us do this i concur yeah thank you so much and I for think pushing it, through i think it, it's clear that it's worth it when we can have a conversation like you all just had right now and 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 obviously we do hope that you stay in touch and stay in conversation because you know that's what mo pop is for that's excuse me that's what the popcon is for and you know and uh yeah and i'm really excited to see more of these conversations happen if you haven't had a chance to see these video presentations yet they're really great they're really remarkable and i fear they may have intimidated some folks to not turn theirs in or turn theirs in on time so please check out alex and dallas's um, presentations. They're in the link in the chat. Um, and we're going to be officially on a 30 minute break before we zoom over to stage number two. Thank you all for enduring our first uh, technical hitches. This is the first time we've ever done this. Um, and so, you know, hopefully I'll have my internet back by the second part of the day, uh, which will be hosted by JD Sampson. So see you all over in Zoom two. Later.